Good afternoon and welcome to the Enlight Lecture Series. Our topic today is um, energy, so circular economy and the environment. Um, this is the final lecture um, in the um, subject area of energy and we have four speakers that we welcome today. It is my pleasure to introduce you to um, our speakers from four Enlight universities. We'll start with uh, Ana Picayo Perez from the University of the Basque Country, north of Spain. And um, our second talk will be by Rachel McAdle from the University of Galway, Ireland. We'll then move on to Groningen, to the Netherlands, and Franz uh, Sigma. And our final talk will be by uh, Matos Mishik from the Comenius University of Bratislava. Um, the plan for today is to give 10 minutes for each talk for um, each participant, um, each of our speakers. Um, and in the meantime, we'll gather the questions from the chat. So if you have any questions for our speakers, please do feel free to post them in the chat. We'll bring them together in the end for a joint discussion. So we have around um, 15 to maybe 10 minutes for a joint discussion. And um, this Enlight lecture is also followed by a networking event to which our viewers have received a separate invitation. This event um, um, can be joined by all of the um, speakers and the viewers from Enlight universities. Right, um, if you're not part of the working of the networking event, but still feel like getting in touch with our speakers, um, for networking purposes, please um, do feel free to get in touch with, um, with the Enlight organizing team here at the University of Göttingen. Um, so this is how we will proceed. Um, to our speakers again, all the questions will be posted in the chat because our viewers um, cannot turn on their microphones or cameras, so they are just here to listen to you. Um, so I think we can start with our first presentation um, by Ana Picayo Perez from the University of the Basque Country in Spain, who is here today with her talk on thermal economics for managing the efficiency of buildings thermal systems. Anna is currently an assistant professor at the University of the Basque Country, north of Spain, and a researcher of the Consolidated Enedi Group. She got her PhD in energy efficiency and sustainability in engineering and architecture area in 2018. Her research areas are related to testing, analysis, and optimization of building energy supply system, thermoeconomics, and diagnosis of apl application in buildings. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome Anna here at the Enlight Lecture Series. Anna, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, as Anna introduced me, I came here to present the following session entitled Thermoeconomics for Managing the Efficiency of Buildings, Thermal Systems Inside the Circular Economy and Environment Enlight Context. As the title includes, I would like to promote energy efficiency in building thermal systems, but with a novelty that is applying thermoeconomics discipline in this kind of building system. Because of that, the presentation has is divided in seven session, uh, sections. The first one contains the objectives uh, of this presentation. Then I explain which is the exergy variable and which is the meaning of that in order to quantify the quality of an energy flow. After that, I introduce XRG in building systems. Then we will uh, introduce also the thermoeconomic discipline in uh, explaining briefly the scopes and its application. Then I show you briefly also a case study in the Basque Country and uh, explain the requirement of applying all this theory and all, all this um, discipline in dynamic way. And I will finish this presentation with the conclusions about uh, the current research lines and the future research lines. So let's start with the, the objectives. 
and I will try to answer the question of which are the common objectives around the world or around the European Union. As everybody knows, they are different, well, many goals for sustainable development and among them and regarding energy, we want to use renewable energies to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and uh, try to make economic savings. If we look about which are the, the biggest consumers around the world, we can divide it in three main groups, which are industry, buildings, and transport. And buildings consume almost the third part of the energy consumption in the world. And also, uh, we need also to know which kind of energy is required inside buildings, because we need to supply the thermal demands for heating, cooling, and domestic hot water. And those demands are uh, energy flows that do not exceed uh, the 60 degrees Celsius. Nevertheless, uh, many times this kind of demands are generally satisfied from combustion of fossil fuels, which can make higher temperature energy flows. Therefore, somehow there is a lack of mass in between the temperature or the energy quality in between the consumption and the, the demand energy flow. This led us to introduce a new concept that is well, maybe for somebody it's not new, but let's try to explain what is exergy and what does exergy measure. In order to do that, that explanation, I want to make you a riddle and ask you a question. What weighs more, one kilogram of straw or one kilogram of iron? I think that everybody will say that uh, both weigh the same because they have the same mass. And here in the earth, uh, the way they generate the same weight, which is measuring Newton. So let me make another question. And remember that energy is measured in kilojoules or kilowatt hours. And the question is the following. Which has more energy? A battery container, a chemical energy with a total of 100 kilojoules or a pot full of hot water containing 100 kilojoules? I think that everybody will answer that they have the same amount of energy because energy is measured in kilojoules. But I will ask you another question. And it's with which energy can we obtain more useful effort? Thinking about the answer, I think that uh, many people will say that we'll easily see that with battery, we can, for example, like a bulb, move a motor in, or a uh, warm up uh, water. And conversely, with the pot, we can only make pasta. <laughs> Over time, that temperature of the water will decrease until it reaches the equilibrium temperature with the environment. So from that moment on, the, that water cannot be able to do any work. So even if they have the same quantity of energy, they have different quality of energy. That quality can be measured by the exergy concept. And in this specific um, example, we can say that uh, the battery's uh, energy, chemical energy, is 100% exergy. But however, the, the heat in the water at 45 degrees Celsius is less uh, exergy. Uh, how can we introduce the exergy concept in buildings? Uh, the idea is to obtain the energy saving pot potential. So let's try to difference in between the energy generation uh, flows and the energy use in, in buildings. Um, we can see that when we burn fossil fuels, so we obtain from power plants electricity, the, the useful work we can obtain from that is high quality uh, flow. So we can use it for lighting or electric devices inside uh, homes. Uh, on its way, we can also obtain energy from uh, lower temperature sources as for example, renewable sources like sun or wind or geothermal that can uh, supply the energy demand of domestic hot water or heating, which are the low quality energy demand. The idea is to cover each demand of the house, adapting it to the specific resource. If we do this, we can obtain what is called or known as low exergy building. However, as many people will notice, uh, we 
we usually use fossil fuels to cover domestic hot water and heat. So energy must be safe. And we know that building sector, a sector has a high potential of energy saving because there is also a lack of quality link between resources and demand. So we need, need to include energy analysis. Let us now introduce the discipline of thermoeconomics. Thermoeconomics is uh, a discipline that combines economics with the second principle of thermodynamics by means of the exergy variable. Uh, this, this discipline began to be applied in power, plant, in power plants in order to use the energy in a better way. And usually power plants are um, has very high consumptions and uh, many times we can uh, analyze them in a steady state. However, uh, as a novelty, this presentation applies thermoeconomics in buildings where the consumption, individually speaking, are much lower and the behavior is very, very dynamic. Uh, in short, thermoeconomics try to make like a distribution of costs along the energy things, energy um, in, in all the energy processes, and we can obtain the energy cost in order to, and there are three main applications. The first one is to do energy audits. The second one to design uh, the control or design the energy systems. And the last one is to make the diagnosis for fault detections and preventive um, energy management. Uh, briefly, as, uh, I will show you a case study in the north of Spain, in the Basque Country, uh, of four building blocks with uh, domestic hot water and heating, uh, heating demand are covered with a boiler room. This is the picture of the energy chains from the production to the demand. The heat is generated in the combustion from the combustion of fossil energy with natural gas in, in boilers. Then that heat is distributed through the system and stored in tanks, and then is supplied in radiation in radiators, uh, warming up the, the indoor air or domestic hot water is supplied by taps. At the end, all that heat is balanced with the ambient and after that there is no possibility to to create useful work if we make a graphic about the energy process in terms of energy and in terms of energy we see that here in the blue line we can see that energy shows a fairly uniform performance which means that this system has a very good energy efficiency from primary well, from generation to supply. Nevertheless, we see that in when we turn to energy parameter, there is um, a very big uh, decrease in in the generation since we use fossil fuels to warm up water, and that means that there are a lot of energy destruction or what is the same real losses that makes that the energy efficiency of the all the system energy efficiency sorry of all the system is very low. Uh, as I already told, thermoeconomics, when it's applied in buildings, we need to take into account that buildings are very, very dynamic systems because the profile of users are variables and also the outside temperature influences in the heating or, or cooling demands. So we need to consider this variable behavior. To do that, uh, we, from the Energy Research Group, we have developed a software that is cap capable of for adapting to different thermal systems. What we do is, first of all, we need to define which system are we working with, and then obtain the da uh, data from the sensors along the system in its time step. After that, we uh, make the corresponding matrix calculations for thermoeconomics application, and then we obtain the energy cost, economic cost, or environmental cost along all the energy chains during all the uh, time steps. Uh, because we only have 10 minutes, I need to conclude this presentation uh, in order to um, well, in order to say how in order to explain how we apply this thermoeconomic software. Uh, currently we have applied this software in seven different case studies, among others. For example, in a nearly zero energy building in the Basque Country. Then in a, in a building that it was rehabilitated 
in order to know which was the increment in energy performance according to the previous situation. We also apply it in an air handed unit for ventilation in, an, in a school, also in a domestic hot water system, in a system with renewable energy that works with solar collectors, with a, um, a big building covering heating and domestic hot water, and also in a new building that has an steering engine. Uh, nowadays, we are working on enhancing our thermoeconomic software by making it unlicensed and free for download, uh, increasing its speed of uh, processing and including the diagnosis for fault detection. We also realized that since we have, since we have a really dynamic behavior, we need to work with a lot of data. So we uh, are trying to implement the thermoeconomic software with artificial intelligence in order to generate a uh, predictive tools with um, links both thermoeconomics and artificial intelligence. And in this way, I think that we will arrive um, a faster to the global goals of energy saving, decrease in, in greenhouse gas emissions and economic savings. Thank you for your attention. And if you have any question, just do not hesitate to ask me. Thank you very much, Anna, for, I would say, as always, a very interesting contribution to the Enlight Lecture Series and to some new insights into your uh, field of research. Um, Without further ado, I will move on to our next speaker um, from Ireland, um, Rachel McCannell, with a talk on energy poverty and tenants, exploring the links between housing and energy in Ireland. Rachel is a researcher in Ireland working on the topics of energy poverty and her research interests include sustainability, communities, climate justice, energy poverty and housing. Well, I will pass on my microphone to you, Rachel, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna. And thank you our, to Anna, our other speaker. <laughs> um, so I will start this from the beginning and hopefully you can see my slides loading now. So um, I've already gotten a brief introduction there, so I won't spend too much longer on this, but just to give some of the context for how this research came about. So this research started based on my own research in the area of looking at tenants and tenant rights. Um, and then also my other research area of energy. So trying to bring the two together is what I'll be focusing on today. And I think the main focus of the, if you took one thing away from the presentation today, it was how we can avoid further reproducing inequalities as we moved towards a cleaner planet or as we think about how to um, improve the energy transition. So just to give you then some of the context, um, because we're obviously coming from very different countries and different um, different legis legis legislative contexts um, around the around the European Union, the Irish government similar to many other EU countries, has committed to a lot of different climate obligations. And most recently in 2023, it, um, it published a revised climate action bill, which commits to Ireland being climate neutral by 2050. There's a lot of work being done in the area of energy justice or just transitions. That's talking about how we need to move away from the over-reliance on technical solutions only and try and think about how those technical solutions need to be embedded in social solutions. So that's very much the perspective I'm coming from. We need, I argue that we need to avoid any climate mitigation plans that, again, further reproduce these inequalities that already exist. And this is echoed in the Sustainable Development Goals, which I was happy to hear Anna mention in her talk. So goal seven is centered on affordable and clean energy, as many of you may know. And sometimes there can be a tendency to maybe think of the, the people at the most who are the most energy vulnerable or energy poor. But the context I'm talking about is people who live in developed nations 
um, as Ireland is, but are really suffering from energy vulnerability, even within that context. And this has also been made wor worse by the rising cost of living crisis, housing crisis and geopolitical instability in terms of energy costs. So energy within environmental geography then has been thought about in a number of different ways, but the the intersection between energy and tenants hasn't been explored fully, although more research is being done every year. So this is another uh, quote from Jenny Stevens, who's a really, really excellent climate scholar. And she's talking about how there needs to be, we need to understand climate crisis from these multiple different perspectives. And according to the European Foundation, just transition is a term used to describe the transition to a climate neutral economy while securing the future and livelihoods of workers and their communities. So I think that's important to say at the outset that it's we're thinking not just about um, uh, mitigating climate, but all, also the all of the other aspects around the climate. So working the workforce, families, how we live our lives. Within the work done on Ireland, then uh, there's a lot of work being done in the area of what landlords can do, what different kind of charities or not and uh, government organisations can do. But there's less being done it from the tenant perspective. And that's really, really what I want to focus on, because I think there's a lot of um, there's a need to focus on the practices of people dealing with energy poverty or energy vulnerability. And one way that's really been highlighted or has come out through my research is that energy poverty or vulnerability is inseparable from housing insecurity and just to give you a bit of context then to the Irish private rental sector similar to many other contexts at the minute there's a huge housing crisis and um, a lot of housing insecurity high levels of homelessness and increasingly high levels of family homelessness which is something we haven't seen before in Ireland so high levels of families being supported in semi-state locations um, that are neither private homes but are not um, are not funded places, fully funded places either. So there's a lot of privatisation going on there. And within this, we see a bigger generation rent or generation stay at home. So this is people in their 20s, 30s and 40s. And they are staying at home in their original family home longer and longer because their housing um home ownership is no longer a viable option for them but we still within the field of energy there's often a focus on how we can fix things within homes and there's a disconnect there between how much power a tenant has to fix the energy in their home if they don't own their home and also how much um how much power they have but also maybe how much capacity they have if they're dealing with other issues such as trying to pay for their food or other things so again, this connection between housing and climate needs to be better understood. And that was the, the idea behind the research. And also this is kind of key to understanding this energy poverty as inseparable from other forms of poverty. So when we're speaking about how to, how to move or how to improve this, how to improve poverty outcomes, we need to start thinking about energy poverty as key. And again, thinking from the European context of the different people here, there's a many of you might have heard of this, but there's a the summer euro barometer that was taken in 2022. So that's asking people in different countries about certain things. And what's interesting about the Irish case is that a lot of people mentioned a lot more people in Ireland mentioned rising prices of housing, inflation and cost of living. So it was 65 percent in Ireland mentioned that versus the EU average of 54 percent. And 48% in Ireland picked housing as an issue versus 6% in the EU. And 15% chose energy versus 22%. So what we're seeing again is housing masking or covering up the larger problem of energy. So I really think we need to unpack the relationship between the two of them. So in 2023, Ireland reached its highest rate of, right, highest rate sorry, of energy poverty at 29%. And energy poverty can be defined as more than 10% of the household income being spent on energy, including electricity, but excluding motor fuel. There's a lot of work being done um, by Catherine Butler, Butler and Lucy Middlemas exploring the complexity around the issue of energy poverty. So uh, Catherine Butler's work in particular has focused on 
the impact that energy poverty has in people's daily lives beyond just being able to turn the heating on. And uh, Lucy Middlemiss and her colleagues in the UK have also said that usually people uh, fuel, fuel or energy poverty is a sign of this kind of deeper systemic problem. And even though there's a lot of interventions in the area, it's such a multifaceted or complex issue that we need to think about the, the complexity there. And this is kind of where I am with the research. And again, this is an ongoing piece of research, but the, the main, sorry, um, the main problem is that landlords are incentivized to retrofit their properties. Tenants don't have the same access, but yet we're not understanding the lived realities of what tenants are experiencing in terms of energy poverty or energy vulnerability. And um really how can we think about including tenant perspectives and energy plans and what potential impact could this have on policy and this is the research plan as i said this is an ongoing project it's only kind of i've only started it this year but the focus is to analyze tenants financial situations as a way as a qualitative marker of their larger energy situ energy energy context i suppose um, and to focus on energy poor and vulnerable households while also being mindful that that language can be quite contentious and we need to maybe um, be careful around how to recruit people based on that. And that's kind of been a, you know, a challenge. But the main thing is working with tenants rather than homeowners, rather than landlords, even though I acknowledge they can also be at risk of energy poverty or energy vulnerability. But again, focusing on this group that isn't focused on as much. And this is the conclusion. So I think I'm keeping to time very, <laughs> very briefly. Um, but really uh, trying to understand this in, in intersection between the housing crisis and the energy crisis will strengthen climate change because as Mikko Wicks says there on screen, climate change is not just an environmental issue. It's a social crisis within which multiple oppressions intertwine and interact. So again, it's trying to use energy as a way into this larger complex, complex topic um, and trying to understand the relationship between energy and housing. And the main way I'll be doing that is through focusing on the lived experiences of tenants. And I'd be happy to talk further about the, the planned methodology if people have interest. Um, but keeping in mind the context I began with, with it, which is the move to a just transition. So thank you very much for organizing um, and I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. A big thank you to you, Rachel, for your very insightful presentation. I'm sure we have a lot of uh, questions to uh, address at the end. Um, but now let's turn our attention to the next speaker, to Franz uh, Sietma, Sietma, sorry, <laughs> from the University of Groningen, who is yeah. here um, with a talk on orchestrating the circular transition, building an effective organizational ecosystem. Um, Franz is an associate professor at the Faculty of Spatial Sciences at the University of Groningen at the in the Netherlands, leading the research program on nature and spatial change. He holds a PhD in economics and publishes and teaches subjects in economic geography, um, valuation of nature and landscape, evaluation of spatial plans and projects. Uh, Franz is also director of the Rudolf Agricola School for Sustainable Development of the University of Groningen, where over 200 scholars engage in interdisciplinary research and education for sustainable development. Right, so the floor is yours, Franz. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I'd like to talk about uh, orchestrating the transition to the circular economy. Uh, but I think it's also a nice lineup which we had. Uh, we started out with uh, uh, Anna, who talked about uh, the uh, thermo economics and the, the software that could boost it. And it sort of, in a way, it was technical. And then Rachel came on and said, well, uh, uh, if we talk about sustainability and also circularity, uh, it's not only technical, it's also about a social opposites and, 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 and contrast and inequality. And we have to be aware of that. And um, my talk is a bit more at the, uh, we could say, at, at the governance level of uh, on sustainability and circularity. So I think it's a nice, uh, a nice build-up in this uh, in this series. 
Um, I will start sharing the screen now to uh, give you a presentation and work we've done uh, in our group. And um, let me see where we are. Okay. Good. Uh, Anna, could you please check whether everything's okay? Yes, everything's perfect. You're good okay, to go. Good. good. So, uh, about orchestrating the circular uh, transition, um, uh, it's, uh, let me see how the slides transfer here. Yeah. So, I'd like to first, since we're in this thin light consortium, I think it's also nice to share a bit about the organizational background of where this comes from. Uh, so we're at the University of Groningen, that is in the Netherlands. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm leading the Rudolf Agricola School for Sustainable Development. And um, that is an, an invention, an, an organizational invention, you could say, in which uh, uh, we bring together scholars from different disciplines to work together on sustainability. And uh, it's uh, since science in, in this time and age is kind of scattered in a way, we over-specialize. That's an organic development in science. Uh, uh, but since this is happening, uh, we need some counterforce, and the Rudolf Agricola is a counterforce in that, in that it, um, it tries to bring scientists back together. And that is especially needed because we have grand societal challenges, as we saw with climate change and biodiversity loss, and the earlier speakers always also talked about that. And uh, today, my focus is on circularity. Um, now, we have some 200 fellows in our group, uh, in our uh, school, the Rudolf Agricola School for Sustainable Development. We have four big research themes. It's too much today to, to go into that. but And we have some 35, so 30 plus interdisciplinary research groups. And they, they are up in some islands and sustainability. They work on democratic innovations as a group for that. They have one on risk crisis and resilience and that type of thing. But we also, today we talk about one of these groups and that's the circular economy research group. And uh, the research is about the Netherlands and I hope you know where it is, but if you don't, it's you can see it here, it's uh, in, in, in Europe. And uh, we focus on the Northern Netherlands, actually, the, the, the top part and within the top part. So we have three provinces and Groningen is one of the major cities, the biggest city in the North. And that is where our university is. But this is also where our project, uh, our research project on circularity to, to, took place. And if you think about this, um, this region in Europe, I, I tend to, I like to call it an institutional Valhalla. It is sort of like anything you'd ever wished for, it's there. So we have democratic municipalities, we have democratic provinces, we have collaborations between the provinces. Uh, we have um, a lot of NGOs that function and that are influencing policy that are lobbying. We have, uh, uh, so many, many things are in place. And then in that context, there is this uh, regional translation of urgent national aims. And this, these national aims for the Dutch economy are that it should be 50% circular in 2030, that is six years from now. <laughs> and it should be 100% circular in 2050. And that is a huge transition. And that is something which, if we want to do that together, it should happen fast because 50% in 2030, we are a long way from that. So uh, this is where our project started, doing research on that. And um, like I said, it's an institutional Valhalla. So we had a, a big consortium uh, with, with many, many organizations. And many organizations were sort of in between business and policy. It was funded by the provinces and, and the collaborating uh, provinces and the central ministry. But many of the partners were uh, in these intermediary positions uh, between business and policy. And um, we call this project is Noord Nederland for the Circular. So the Northern Netherlands earns circular, uh, which has a double connotation of making money, but also deserves to be circular. Um, 
I present this, but you don't have to look at all these names, but it was a big team effort because that is the core of our institute is that we bring people together from different disciplines. So on the, on the, the vision report, which is the core now of, of what I will present, we have some uh, nine scholars working there. And we also did a separate report on the uh, compensating the ecological footprint of production. And there also we had a team of uh, seven, we had a team of seven people. So also from various disciplines. Um, but uh, I'd like to bring something home on this. Uh, we made a report and that was about a faster circular transition, listening to the experiences of businesses to lower barriers. And that's a whole mouthful of stuff, uh, but I, it's a simple story actually. Our consortium started out with this initial stand that circularity is about convincing companies to become circular. So we have an infrastructure of organizations and the idea is you approach people and say, come on, Joe, you also uh, join in the circular transition, make your company circular. And then you go to Jim and say, come on. And then you go to Stacy and he said, come on, everybody gets circular. So the idea was to make a smooth, what they call them in, in our consortium, what was called a, a customer journey. So you come to a, this intermediary people and they say, well, you know, have you heard of this idea? And have you heard of this idea, this, that, that idea? And, and you also try to be circular. And they say at the, the start of this project, uh, we, the, 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 these, comp these uh, intermediates said, well, we currently serve something like 10, 20, 30 companies per year in the Northern Netherlands. And we want to make it hundreds because we have a whole challenge. And this is where we, in this project, we came in as academics to see what the vision could be for uh, circularity in the Northern Netherlands. And this is why we had this team of scholars. And um, we had quite a bit of contact with um, businesses. So via surveys and interviews, we contacted something like 400 businesses and talking about circularity and their experiences. And uh, well, you learn a lot from that. And it was very hugely interesting, I, I must say. So uh, this is Dutch uh, at the back, but at the uh, top. So uh, several companies were uh, big and smaller, but they, they said, we are very dependent on others. We would like to, or we, we have a sort of an inclination to become circular, but there's a large interdependence in the value chain. Uh, there's various companies that say, well, it's just too expensive and there's too little demand. There's people say, well, regulations and legis legislation work against the transition. And there's also companies say that it's no way that we can be circular. We're just too polluting this whole process. Uh, and actually they said, well, we should have less customers because it's just uh, uh, our production process can never be circular. So we have 400. These are sort of 10 typical cases. Uh, I, di I digest some four big aspects into all these aspects. You can have make different plans about what to do. You might say, well, we have to have more customers if we have too little demand, or we have might have to have a new uh, subsidy arrangement to, uh, to, to make sure that it isn't too expensive. Um, and so, and, and uh, you might say, well, we need to go lobbying for new regu regulations or new law, or we have to do fundamental research on new products or new, new uh, uh, materials. So a whole branch of things which you could do. But the major thing that came to us while we talked to all these businesses, and despite all the institutional arrangements that are already there and all the organizations, we were wondering who is listening to all these business experiences? And we had this whole consortium, but we said, who's listening? And who is acting upon it? And that proved to be basically not there. So we said the major thing we need to do is make a ecosystem intervention. We need an orchestrating transition group that arranges a stronger collaboration between businesses, government, academia, civil society, and NGOs that fight and lobby for the nature and the, or take care of the nature and the environment. 
And this transition group needs to systematically monitor what businesses experience and then take action to change the system. Because otherwise, this will not work. I made a nice, what we made in this project, a nice scheme about this. What is currently happening is that we have this system here in, in the, uh, uh, this rectangle. We have businesses, the blue dots, and we try to make them green. And then we say, well, we start with one, and then we have three, and we go on, and then th that's the process. We say, no, you should listen to the businesses that try to become green, and then think about what needs to change in the system so that the other companies that start this process, that they have a much more accommodating system. And then if we have an active group with some, let's say a few million per year, uh, 15 people from different, from the quintuple helix, then we can really perform. And then we can change the system much faster as we need to do because 2030 is only six, six years ahead. So, and that is why we need this transition group. And well, basically that was our research. It's a bit of a meta uh, governance intervention. Uh, we, uh, we argue for, and we're currently in the process of trying to arrange that. And that's a difficult process, but we're still, uh, uh, we have our several consortium members have committed to it and we're, uh, well, we're trying to realize that. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Franz, for your for your contribution, for your talk. And I think now we can move on to our last speaker, Matos Mischik from the Pomenius University of Bratislava, with a talk on EU energy policy following Russian invasion of Ukraine towards a common external energy policy. Matos is Associate Professor at the Department of Political Science at Comenius University in Bratislava. His research interests include small states and energy security in the EU. He is the author of External Energy Security in the European Union, published in 2019, co-author of Energy Transitions in Central and Eastern Europe, published in 2024, oh, just this year, and he has also published articles in journals, including Nature, Nature Energy, Energy, Energy Policy, and Geopolitics. Um, thank you much for joining this lecture, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for having me. Uh, I will try to share my presentation now. I hope it, it works. Um, it is. Um, so I will be I will be talking today. A little bit about governance, uh, about governance at the level of the European Union, and um, I'm I'm going to try to talk about what what is the situation uh, when it comes to energy policy and uh, climate policy, and this kind of fits into into today's talk from a broader perspective because this is kind of an umbrella that influences both uh, circular economy, it influences. Uh, uh, buildings and uh, policies uh, around around them. So, uh, more or less everything that is happening at the EU level influences member states, and th there is a little bit like tension between these two level of governance when it comes to energy policy and also climate, because the EU has uh, has some competencies over energy and climate policy, but uh, member states uh, still have some. So these are shared competence. Um, or so-called shared competence at the, uh, within the EU. So th th there are some advantages to this, but also some disadvantages. And uh, my main argument here is that following the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there has been some development towards cre uh, at the EU level to create a common approach to, to energy, common approach to import of energy from, from abroad because the EU is dependent on, on the imports. But it, it hasn't been fully developed yet so it's still somewhere somewhere in the in the middle uh, the eu has been talking about energy policy and climate policy since, since the very late 80s and and early 2000s respectively so uh, there has been a lot of done already for example energy internal energy market is is, is, is developed uh, there are many rules that the whole system, whole sector was liberalized in the sense that uh, before, in during the 80s, during the 90s, 
uh, it, there was only one supplier of electricity in each country, basically. There was only one supplier of natural gas. Now we can we can share uh, who we are going to buy electricity from, who we are going to buy gas from, and there can be some uh, challenges to that. Uh, so now the system is, is being a little bit um, re revised. But uh, although there was a lot of development in this area, in the area of internal market, there was uh, very little interest in energy security, meaning that there was an there was an idea that even if there will be a insufficient amount of energy somewhere, the market will solve the problem. Meaning that uh, that there will be market players who will supply those member states, those areas of the EU, which would have problem with energy security because there will be demand. So the the market would would uh would support this and this was one type of development within the european union the other type of development was that there was uh, there started to be a lot of um interest in uh in decarbonization especially after 2015 2016 uh, and the idea here was again that um the decarbonization will also help with energy security because when there will be less need for uh, carbon, high carbon uh, fuels, meaning natural gas or oil, um, and then this energy security won't be won't be a problem because we'll produce so much energy uh, within the European Union, and this energy will be from renewable energy energy sources. So this will be whole whole this whole decarbonization will kind of help us to to uh, deal with energy security. So first, I mean, in, in late 2021 or autumn, when the autumn 2021 uh, arrived, uh, it turned out that this is not really, uh, this is not really the case and it doesn't really work that well. Uh, there, um, these two assumptions. There were even actors, namely Russia, who started to uh, abuse or miss abuse the rules existing uh, within the European Union to play 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 the market and uh, um, help or they, they helped to increase the pricey by not uh, not following the recommended levels of, of uh, underground uh, storages of for natural gas and and uh, other 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 rules that existed already then and then there were a lot of um, a lot of issues connected to uh to supplies uh that were blamed on maintenance and blame on the um, other things but uh weather and, and so and so on and so on but it was all connected to a russian uh energy weapon or russian russia using using energy uh weapon so uh it turned out that the eu approach to energy security didn't really didn't really work, and the market wasn't able uh, wasn't able to to deal with the situation because the the market tools were based on assumption there will be always enough gas coming to the European Union, which was not true anymore, and the carbonization wasn't also helping a lot because uh, the assumption was that uh, the 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 carbonization the carbonization will lead to uh, increase of renewable sources and there was there there has been a significant increase but it's still not not enough and there is uh, there is a period uh, some transition period between the current system and the um, the carbonized system which requires still fossil fuels like natural gas like like oil and oil and and these were just stopped coming from Russia or this uh, they were coming in a in a much lower uh, amount. Uh, so, the, and and the EU is 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 very much dependent on on supplies because, um, because it doesn't produce uh doesn't produce um, fossil fuels back home. Or it used to some countries, for example, uh, uh the, the Netherlands, uh, used to produce a lot. It doesn't anymore. Uh, UK uh, is a still big producer, but it's not a member of the EU anymore. So there were some, there are some, there are some issues, and uh, because of this, the overall uh, dependency on energy from abroad within the European Union increased, increased significantly. 
Uh, so currently the or after after the after the pandemic the idea was that um that we will we need to restart our economy and uh, that we can we can do this in a way that will be beneficial also for other um other goals of the european union namely the climate goals so that the restart of the economy should be should be green we should invest a lot into uh renewable energy sources and and very similar argument um was applied or, or, or was used after the russian invasion of ukraine when the discussion was about that we need to get rid of russian and uh, energy sources and the way how to do uh, do this is to uh, focus on green energy which can be produced uh, at, at home uh and there is there is a lot of interest or a lot of uh, focus on on this but uh the processes are are rather rather slow and uh, it takes a while to switch your economy from fossil fuels to to other type of fuels because it just takes time to uh first of all develop new energy sources and even if you have them to, to build the new new capacities um, and and when when uh and at the EU level all of these meant that there, there is a lot of interest all of a sudden uh in in energy security at the Matis, EU level Matis, yes uh, I I see no slide transition and I thought it was oh. with my laptop only but it now seems no. that other no people one. also do not see that okay thank you for perhaps you should briefly pick it up thank you yeah, I think sorry, sorry about it, because I'm 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 changing my slides all the time. Yeah, so, I see your slides, but I see no transition. Yeah. Um. So I think I, I will. I just see your opening slide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand that. Uh, can you see a different slide now? I now see another slide, and I saw it. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yes. Yeah, Thank sorry. you. I I I had no idea how this how this works to be honest. So no, it doesn't work now either. Again, does it work now? Um yes. Okay. okay yes. So now, yes. now, now we can see. Yeah. yeah. Maybe right. This, uh, this Thank is you. Probably an update that I wasn't aware of. Um. So um. So what what the what the EU did was they started to be interested in energy energy security. Uh, although there is a, still a difference between uh, um, the EU level and member states level, uh, and we've seen this uh, when uh, when it uh, comes to uh, comes to so you miss so many slides. Never mind, and I put so much effort into <laughs> making uh, putting a lot of uh, lot of graphs in them. Um, so there is a difference between EU level and and some member states and other member states because uh, some are very much interested in uh, in energy security, some are. Are much less, and there is not a, a unison at, a still at the uh, at the EU level or among among member states, and because member states have the competencies uh, when it comes to uh, energy security or energy mix to be more precise in their own hand, this means that uh, this means that uh, the uh, that all of them needs to agree on on creating something at the at the EU level to integrate deeper. Uh, within this uh, within this area, energy security area, and there is there has been some development. For example, the EU started to uh, purchase some natural gas together, meaning that the Commission created the the platform to which uh, member states and their their natural gas companies can submit requests how much gas they uh, they need, and and also the suppliers of gas they can. Um, uh, they can submit what they what they have and what they want to what to want to sell. And once these demands and the supply is met, then a deal deal is deal is met, um, uh, done. And uh, this means that um, the whole idea is that the EU as a whole is much stronger, uh, much stronger uh, actor uh, at the global natural gas market. As individual member states, some member states are, of course, much stronger. Germany is, is a very, very strong um, actor, but other members like you know, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Hungary, they are much, much smaller or Baltic states. So, uh, so once they work together, it, it's very much convenient, especially for the for the smaller 
small ones. But still, um, this is uh, this concerns only very rather small, rather small volumes, and uh, the uh, the European Union is still not united um, to this day uh, when it comes to to energy security, in spite of the in spite of of, of the situation that uh, led to some changes, in spite of the uh, the problems with energy uh, security. So this uh, talks a lot about uh, the impact of um, the impact of, of, of window of opportunity or the theoretical concept or how uh, how a power dependency uh, in impacts uh, impacts energy policy and energy security and how how uh, a crisis can or cannot change uh, policies of the European Union. In fact, uh, it's uh, depending on integration. Uh, thank you very much, and sorry for the glitch with the slides. Thank you very much, Matos, for your very insightful presentation. And thank you to all of the speakers for your contributions. I think we can open the floor to four questions now. Yes, it would be great to see all of our speakers today on the screen. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat and we'll address them to the speakers. Matos, you already have a question or? Oh, sorry, but I hope it's okay because I'm yes. talking. This is a discussion, so do please feel free to ask each other questions. I, I would like to ask uh, Rachel one question because this is very kind of, I, 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 it's very much of interest to me and I think it's, it's very difficult how do you differentiate between poverty and energy poverty? I mean, like, how can you tell that, you know, because if people don't have money, you know, then, I mean, is there, is there a difference? I mean, what would you, what would you say? Thank you. Thank you, Mateusz. That is a very good question and a very difficult question to answer. I think they're definitely very, very connected. I suppose the, method i am using is i you know there is the definition of energy poverty which sits within poverty but as i am starting to recruit participants i'm approaching it from the position of energy poverty as the as the driver sitting within housing as an issue so i suppose it's a bit of self-identification of you know for for participants is that relevant for me but i mean it's certainly there's a lot of kind of contention i think around the de different definitions and they're obviously country dependent so yeah that's the approach i've chosen for that but yeah it's a, it's a tough tough call to make <laughs> thank you thank you thank you I would like to, if I may, um, think Go about ahead. it. Uh, uh, Mattis and Rachel actually, in a way, both talk about a, a social divide, sort of. And uh, what is at the EU level, that small countries and big countries, and they can't agree. And and uh, then Rachel and, and the let's say the poor and, and the rich and the disparities we have and uh, uh, do we see I mean if, if that that seems to be one of our big problems to say you could say solidarity or or being a stronger community but you work at different levels but how, how can you how can you achieve such a thing or what would be possible routes for for science or society to to go more into that direction. Rachel first. <laughs> sure. Thank you very much, Franz. And again, a really important question, I think. Um, to me, the answer would lie in using these studies. So I agree there's a lot of, you know, interest in similarities with my work and Mateusz's work. But I think using that work as a tool to influence policy. So this, you know, science policy interface, that's where I see it as as that the the goal 
I suppose, um, for how to not only investigate the things that we've all been mentioning the four, across the four papers, the issues we've recognised, but then to push that to the next stage. So in my work, it would be to then engage with policymakers from the perspective of people experiencing the problem and try and see if there's any way to to help but again that's a you know it's a big societal challenge so i don't think it's going to be an easy thing to do but hopefully there's some something there in that interface i think that could help but mateusz i don't know if you've a, <laughs> an additional yeah, insight yeah, it, it's it's one of those files that we haven't seen or maybe have oh, bring it up it. bring it up yes um, please and uh, the I, I will i will just it will take like too long sorry my presentation is way too long for this short the period so uh, when it comes to solidarity it became a, a concept a legal concept a couple of years ago within the eu energy policy um and many countries still though ignore it and it, it's not very uh, the solidarity is not very i mean it's not for free so it means that when one country experiences uh, energy security problem doesn't have gas for example other country um do have to support it under spe special circumstances and they get a lot of money for that. So it's, it's not really a solidarity. And it was actually very interesting when solidarity was discussed because some countries like my country, Slovakia, uh, the, the government uh, back in 2009 during one of those uh, energy crises were, 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 was, uh, was saying that we need solidarity and that other countries need to be solidar with, with Slovakia and support that. And give uh, give us some uh, gas, and then uh, during some other periods of time when other countries need solidarity in other areas, for example, uh, but also in energy policy uh, area in, in natural gas sector, the uh, Slovak government was saying that this is not good time for solidarity. So uh, the solidarity is, is very special concept within the European Union. Member states are using them very, um, very vaguely or depending on how do they how do they uh, what is best for them okay so it doesn't work at all at the at the EU level no but anna anna has a solution she has this model of uh, balancing the cost and 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 the environmental impact so if you say well solidarity is not for free anna how do you see this can we can we gain more solidarity if we say our share the cost or are more aware of let's say environmental impact versus cost your x x energy or yeah. that's a, a really difficult question for me because no, no, i'm no, totally no. technical you can handle it <laughs> uh, now i'm breath uh, uh, yes i think that maybe we can introduce also solidarity in our research we try to to make the systems as optimal as possible, but then I think that some people has resources and, and other people not. So we need to somehow share the same for everyone, but it's, it's, we, we can try to in, include also um, social aspects, but for the moment <laughs> we try. For, for our, our work is easier indeed because it's numbers. But yeah, but can you, can I would you like to have that. Can you help Rachel with building the software so that, let's say, relatively poor people can do better? Indeed, we have in our research group and Eddie, there is uh, some people that they are working with energy poverty, but in terms of. With? Yes, sorry, with? With energy poverty. Okay. Because. And how the can end, your software help? Uh, in, maybe I, I will try to give the answer, but I'm super technical, so. Uh, usually we have a concept that is comfort concept. Comfort means it's totally also not see it. it's not the same comfort in Netherlands or comfort in Spain because some people can be in a comfort in 19 degrees and other people need 21 degrees. But uh, just think that in Basque, Basque country we need 20 degrees during the year and th those people that they are lower than 20 degrees inside their homes. We, we usually, usually we call them that they are in energy poverty. So we, yeah. in my case, I can control the thermal system in order to maintain them in 20 degrees Celsius. But the reason why they are on poverty, it's more traitor or 
or matters in research. I I would Yeah, like that's to also everybody. a nice, I, I like actually this uh, physical definition of, of energy poverty. So because Well, it's uh, this is what, very very um, simple one. Eh? I think that they are no, more. no, it's very direct. What's wrong with simplicity if it's sharp, you know, so that's okay. I think uh, because uh, Matus asked uh, Rachel, so how do you define and what, what is it exactly? And then he said, well, we ask people and it depends on how much budget they have and what is the biggest thing to do. Uh, the share in the, of their energy expenditure in the budget. And then you come up with, well, you know, it's just comfort in different Numbers. zones. We have. And if, if it's too cold, there's something wrong. <laughs> yeah. And it might be an individual here and there. But if you do that for, let's say, 100 houses, you, you probably know where the poverty is. So it's actually a technical information can help social policy there, I think, quite strongly. Because You're people right. might also... say not want to know not want to state that they're poor actually and then you say no 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 i'm okay i'm okay you know <laughs> so the natural tendency but then you measure and you say oh no no they have it at 15 degrees uh, you know so you, you can measure so it might be nice Yes. okay now matis how do we reach comfort in uh, in eu energy politics <laughs> No, it's a real question. I think I think the I think the uh, the commission and um, other bodies that uh, are in charge of budget needs to be a little stricter when it comes to certain issues connected to rule of law and uh, following budgetary rules of the European Union. Because that So it's that seems it's to be the way how how kind of uh, seems to be the thing to which some countries that um, are not really are or are having troubles in in democratic dimension are responding very well recently. Okay. Um, I don't know if it's a, you can think of policy in different ways. You can say it, there's this saying that polit politicians say, well, uh, make us decide in a certain direction. They sort of want sort of, we often think that politicians have a, have a lot of ideas and, and vision and want to go somewhere, but quite often they're just, they're listening to what, Well, at least in democratic societies, they're sort of listening in to where should I go? Where's the majority here and there? And I think a lot of energy policy has to do with that people freak out if, you know, if, if it's, it's prices are too high or the comfort is too low. And politicians are sort of sensing that. And if, if the majority of the people would be okay with 15 degrees Celsius in their homes, I mean, there would be no problem in uh, reducing gas, but... Uh, You know, and they would be happy to do that. So it's also, it's a, it's a, what is this? It's an interaction between, let's say, policymakers and and the broader inhabitants. And obviously, we have differences of opinion also. But I think there's something with uh, we, we we might do something with measuring comfort across countries. Actually, if we talk about Ukraine and the discomfort which they have and comfort and In the homes, that that might be a nice, uh, nice way of uh, thinking about these matters. Anyway, okay, nice. We had a nice conversation. And on this note, I would suggest that we move on to the networking event of Enlight, um, for which um, some of our viewers have also signed up. Um, for that, we'll move on to a separate room on Zoom, and all of you should have received a link for that in a separate email, as well as the viewers who have registered for the event. But I would also like to mention if some of um, You or our viewers are not joining the network event, but would still like to stay in touch um, or maybe connect for further research um, with our um, speakers today. Please do feel free to contact the Enlight office here at the University of Göttingen or your Enlight offices, and we'll make sure that you um, stay connected. And I would like to thank all of our speakers for your very valuable contributions to this final lecture in our energy lecture series in, in light.
Um, thank you for this fruitful discussion as well. Um, it can also continue in the networking event or further. Maybe it gave us all food for thought um, and for further research. Thank you very much for joining this lecture today and goodbye. <laughs>